The following incidents and events depicted are true to historical fact. However, not all incidents had clips or photographs. Contemporaneous footage and artistic renditions will be used to represent those incidents. A complete bibliography, as well as the link to the previous episode, are included in the video description. A rock and roll singer, riding high on a recent national chart hit, as well as an appearance in a high-profile musical, holds close to 20,000 Chicago teens in attendance, spellbound. It is Gene Vincent, and his performance was electric. The former Vincent Eugene Craddock hunched over his microphone, at once suggestively and menacingly breathing and moaning over the lyrics to songs such as the bluesy Woman Love, and shouting out with Hold Me, Hug Me, Rock Me, while leering at the audience. At one point, Vincent pulled up his pants leg, revealing the metal brace where he had sustained a leg injury during his time in the United States Navy. The leg never healed, and Vincent drowned out the chronic pain with alcohol, but he also incorporated the partially handicapped and mangled leg into his act at one point, rolling his eyes back up and collapsing to the floor in a seeming faint while slowly convulsing, suggestively thrusting his torso up and down to the beat of the music, simulating a love act with the stage floor before rising to his feet to belt out his biggest hit, the iconic rockabilly number that he had co-written while drunk and looking at a popular comic strip character, B. Bapalula. Vincent's teenage audience went wild, screaming so loudly that his breathy vocal delivery could barely be heard as they jumped out of their seats, crowding the stage, reaching for him and jitterbugging in the aisles. The teens that made up the majority of the packed audience at the Chicago Stadium were indeed his audience, despite Vincent being just one of several music acts that Sunday of April 28, 1957. Also on stage at the Chicago Stadium were the local Chicago vocal group, The Highlights, who had scored hits with ballads such as City of Angels and To Be With You, and balladeer Nick Noble, who Life magazine covering the event photographed just outside of the stadium, signing autographs for eager young fans, while local disc jockey Howard Miller of WIND signed autographs for the enthusiastic fans who crowded around the stage inside the arena itself. Rhythm and Blues saxophonist Sil Austin wailed and honked on his sax, giving the young fans another opportunity to dance in the aisles like they would for Gene Vincent's rockabilly numbers, as they did for Rhythm and Blues singer Vicki Nelson. Betty Johnson and iconic lounge singer Mel Torme, who would later attempt to jump onto the specifically teen market and rock and roll bandwagon two years later by appearing in the 1959 exploitation film, Girls Town gave the teenage audience a chance to swoon and sway to their ballads while also providing the adults in attendance music styles that they could relate to. However, judging by the wild reactions from the youthful audience, it was rockabilly singer Gene Vincent who was truly the star of the show. If his suggestive stage antics ran the risk of offending the adults in attendance, it is surprising to note that it was the adult sponsors, one of whom was the local Kiwanis Club, who actually suggested to the team organizers of the event that acts like Gene Vincent be hired in order to ensure the event's success with the intended target audience. The teenagers of the local Chicago area, particularly those teens who today would be termed as at risk for joining street gangs. For this event was not just a concert. The April 28, 1957 show at the Chicago Stadium wasn't simply a concert along the lines of a Dick Clark Caravan of Stars Roadshow, nor an Alan Freed concert at the Brooklyn Paramount where the music was solely, exclusively the focus of the event. As reported in the May 20, 1957 issue of Life magazine, 
The event of that Sunday, April 28, 1957, was a youth rally, the third in fact, organized by the local teens themselves, the organizers being students from the various local Catholic high schools in the area. Life magazine noted that the Chicago Youth Rally was organized in an effort to fight juvenile delinquency with rock and roll and particularly a performance by Gene Vincent used to attract and keep the attending teens interested and excited as the organizers spread their message of good decent behavior and what we would refer to today as gang outreach a regular program of many of today's inner city church youth programs but of particular interest to american inner cities in the 1950s local teen leaders such as mendel catholic high school senior and co-chair of the event tom osborne and alvernia catholic high school's judy cruzo both gave speeches that sought to inspire and even challenge their fellow teens to stay clear of the temptations of inner city street life while assuring the adults in attendance that the youth of their generation, often vilified in the press due to recent reports of violent gang activity, were, by and large, in the majority, generally law-abiding, whose ambitions worked towards the betterment of society. The teen organizers had even brought on several notable adults to give speeches prior to the performances by the Rock and Roll Acts. Top middleweight boxers, champions in their weight divisions at different times during their careers, and rivals, Sugar Ray Robinson and Gene Fulmer, were on hand to give speeches about how playing the game fairly, as opposed to winning, was the most important outcome, both in and outside of the ring. The two boxers would meet four days later in that same arena, with Robinson emerging victorious over Fulmer in the fifth round, a rematch victory over a previous defeat at the hands of Fulmer five months earlier at New York's Madison Square Garden. Hollywood celebrities such as young leading man Robert Wagner and then Warner's contract player Tab Hunter were also in attendance, signing autographs and giving the local event a touch of out-of-town Hollywood glamour which was covered by local Chicago area TV stations. Another notable adult in attendance was, unlike the celebrities, a local Judge Wendell Green, the first African-American to serve as a judge on the circuit court level. Six years before, Green had presided over a highly publicized and politically charged case, the People v. Moretti, which involved the 1951 shooting death of a 15-year-old Hispanic teenager, Arthur Hamino, by police officer Michael Moretti. Green was especially concerned over causes regarding youth crime and racial divisions. And as he led the Chicago teens in a group pledge of good behavior, following on the heels of hymn singing, which was led from the stage in which the audience participated, a recent case of teen gang violence was surely on Green's mind. A month earlier, on March 11, 1957, a 17-year-old Farragut High School honor roll student by the name of Alvin Palmer had been attacked while waiting for a bus after finishing his after-school job. Fifteen teenagers were charged with the attack and one of the accused, 18-year-old Joseph Schwartz, who reportedly yelled out the N-word while beating Palmer to death with a ball-pin hammer, would receive a 50-year sentence for the crime. The racial component of the case was not lost on the press, with reporters, as well as local city leaders, drawing comparisons with other cases of racially charged violence, some of which had involved school integration in the Deep South and, like juvenile delinquency, was another youth-oriented subject that was in the national mind at the time. The racial component of the murder would come back in the national headlines later that year when a white and partially handicapped teenager, 15-year-old Michael Farmer, would be murdered by primarily Hispanic and African-American teens in Highbridge Park, New York. And the following year, when a South Korean foreign exchange student would be murdered by a gang of black teenagers in Philadelphia. It was these political ramifications and issues of race and youth crime that weighed on the minds of the organizers of the event. And it was amidst this environment 
with the Alvin Palmer murder trial still going on at the time leading up to the youth rally that Judge Wendell Green led the oath of good citizenship to the nearly 20,000 teenagers in attendance. Black and white teenagers together at the Chicago Stadium made every effort to show solidarity and surviving photographs by the press noted both the integrated ethnically mixed nature of the stadium's teen audience as well as the fact that despite the wild enthusiasm no incidents of violence by the audience was reported which might have been a novelty to the reporters in attendance since usually when the 1950s press did extensive reports on rock and roll shows associations with juvenile delinquency as opposed to the idea of rock and roll helping to prevent youth crime was the focus such as the 1956 San Jose, California Fats Domino concert at the Palomar Ballroom when the show's organizers oversold tickets beyond capacity while simultaneously selling alcohol to the attendees in line, many of whom would be denied entrance to the show after paying. The result were several reports of assault and property damage at that concert from the previous year and across the country in California. The third annual youth rally at the Chicago Stadium on April 20th, 1957 had no such incidents of youth violence, and the message of youth solidarity with rock and roll garnered national attention and seemed to, temporarily at least, create a sort of truce in the popular media of the time between the press and the then exclusively youth-oriented music which was rock and roll. In reality, a rebranded form of African-American rhythm and blues, its cultural origins not lost on segregationists who, like other politicians who claimed to be defenders of decency, were in very public opposition to the music genre. The obscenity and vulgarity of the rock and roll music is obviously a means by which the white man and his children can be driven to the level with the Negro. It is obviously Negro music. The brief truce between the adult press and the teen music genre was short-lived. The following year, rock and roll would be under attack again with accusations of its causing, or at least attracting, juvenile delinquency. A now legendary concert this one at the Boston Arena and hosted by the disc jockey who is often credited with rebranding black rhythm and blues with the rock and roll colloquial phrase in order to sell the music to white teenagers would be the focus of the public's outcry and renewed accusations between rock and roll and juvenile delinquency. That later concert in Boston would be beset by many problems not the least of which was actual harassment by Boston city officials. However, unknown and certainly unwelcome by the show's promoter and host, the disc jockey Alan Freed, a notorious Boston street gang and their rivals had decided to use the Boston arena and Freed's controversial rock and roll concert as the location to violently settle their differences. It would be just one more incident in a string of incidents that would end Freed's career. The following year, Freed would be charged with bribery during the Payola scandal of 1959. However, that concert would also mark the beginning of the end of the dominance of harder-edged, black rhythm and blues-based, and regional, working-class, white country and western-based rock and roll on the nation's pop charts towards music chart domination by a more suburban, upper-middle class softer, pop-oriented, and less threatening version of rock and roll. This softer, pop-based form of manufactured teen music, led by Philadelphia television host Dick Clark, would hold sway until the British invasion of 1964. The irony of this perceived less threatening version of teen music was that it was often controlled behind the scenes by organized crime. And it is this sound that is often remembered in today's mainstream nostalgic recollections when referencing the harmless, quaint, and unintentionally irrelevant music of the 1950s. This 
is how the public fear of juvenile delinquency in the 1950s shaped the direction of rock and roll. This is part two in the nostalgic myths and historical reality series, Juvenile Delinquency. Bopping, swinging, jitterbugging. A number of terms that we normally associate with dancing, both with the big band era and, for our purposes, 1950s era rock and roll. These terms, dating at least to the big band era of the mid 1930s to the 1940s, if not before, were later utilized by 1950s era teen youth gangs as regional slang terms with double meanings. To the mainstream, to do the bop is to do a 1950s era rock and roll dance made popular on mainstream television on the Philadelphia local TV show that began to be aired nationally on August 5th, 1957, American Bandstand. However, as outlined by the late Professor Eric Schneider, both for the History Channel and in his book on post-war New York gangs, to bop is also to fight. This is also confirmed in separate gang outreach sources, both by the New York City Youth Board's 1959 Outreach Manual and in the memoirs of the late outreach worker in Manhattan's Lower East Side, the Reverend C. Kilmer Myers. Former New York City Youth Board worker and former member of the Simpson Street Boys street gang, Nestor Lamas, also confirmed the term bopper to signify gang fighter for the History Channel. Swinging and jitterbugging, two other terms that are associated with dancing, dating back to the big band era, but later reused a decade later during the rock and roll era, were also appropriated by 1950s gangs, particularly in the New York area, to signify gang fighting. Youth subcultures in the 1950s were separated in ways that today, due to modern social media, today's teens are not. The use of terms that mainstream, or at least former teens who are not involved in the youth gang subcultures that are synonymous with teen dancing, to signify teen gang fighting in the gang subcultures is actually unknown in the mainstream 50s nostalgia context. But it was known to gang outreach workers in the 1950s and to the 1950s press, who gang outreach workers often turn to for getting attention to their programs, which of course helped with the much needed funding for the youth activities that would turn inner city teens away from gang activity and towards activities involving the arts, athletics, and of course education. The use of such slang terms, as well as the fact that rock and roll during the 1950s was an exclusively teen-oriented form of music, attracting both law-abiding as well as troubled gang-oriented teens, added to adult fears of the music. It was amidst this environment that the disc jockey Alan Freed formed a small empire based on rebranded rhythm and blues. However, Freed, formerly of Cleveland, Ohio, and later of New York, faced stiff competition from Philadelphia's Dick Clark for the team market, as well as locally from Jive Patter Platter Spinner, Jocko Henderson, known as the Ace from Outer Space, due to his referencing of the space race, 
as well as his rhyming and proto-rapping introductions to the music acts, much of which had been inspired by Baltimore, Maryland DJ Maurice Hot Rod Hulbert. Amidst this competition, Freed would face many other opponents and obstacles, including the Catholic Archdiocese, who, at that time, was very much in opposition to rock and roll music. Columbia Records a and man and Tin Pan Alley music host Mitch Miller, all of them accused both rock and roll and Alan Freed of attracting juvenile delinquency. A brief but significant economic recession in 1958 and increased competition from fellow rock and roll disc jockeys and promoters prompted Freed to mount a New England live music concert tour amidst the controversy. Announced in February of 1958, Freed's Big Beat Concert Tour was to be a six-week live concert tour of the Eastern Seaboard during the spring of 1958. Freed, who had led the rock and roll radio and concert tour scene during the first half of the 1950s, would not have it so easy. Concert promoter and later owner of the Ringling Brothers Circus, Irving Feld, would simultaneously launch his own biggest show of stars for 1958. Like Freed's Big Beat, also touring the eastern United States, but with additional shows in Canada. Chuck Berry would serve double duty on both Freed's and Feld's shows, but Freed also had Screamin' Jay Hawkins, Joanne Campbell, Larry Williams, and most significantly, Jerry Lee Lewis, who was top billed on the show. Lewis was a rival of Chuck Berry's. Despite the killers being top billed, Barry was actually given the honor of closing the shows, which, by default, gave Barry the star status, aggravating the official headliner, Jerry Lee Lewis. Irving Feld's Biggest Stars of 1958 show had run into some problems on April 13th at the New Haven Arena over in Connecticut. As Paul Anka performed on stage, a fight broke out in the audience, and even though the offenders were escorted out of the theater, the New England press used the incident as an excuse to attack rock and roll, giving the officials in Boston a glimpse of what they might expect when Freed's similar rock and roll show would come to their town. The second rivalry in the works that would undermine the Boston Arena concert, and probably the most significant, though certainly not the only one. Among the thousands of teens who attended Freed's Big Beat Rock and Roll concert at the Boston Arena on the night of May 3, 1958, 5,000 hip kids according to Time magazine, were a group of suburban teenagers from Haverville High School. John Coppola, Bill McGurr, Mike Chase, Sal Gucciardi, and future rock and roll writer, historian, and high school teacher, George Manoogian. Much in the fashion of the 1970s sitcom Welcome Back, Cotter, Manoogian would later return to his alma mater as a school teacher, while also contributing articles on rock and roll history, beginning during the rock and roll revival and nostalgia fad of the 1970s. At the time of Alan Freed's Big Beat concert tour, however, Manoogian was a 17-year-old high school senior at Haverville High. The audience was ethnically mixed, with a 60-40 percentage between white and black teenagers by Manoogian's reckoning. Larry Williams belted out Dizzy Miss Lizzie while lying on his back on top of the grand piano. How he was able to continue playing while backwards is anyone's guess, but the audience went wild. Perhaps the highlight of the evening's first act came towards the end of Joanne Campbell's set. As she musically and suggestively wiggled off stage towards the wings, Screamin' Jay Hawkins, utilizing a human skull attached to a stick, started nipping at her wiggling backside. Playing along in this improvised bit of onstage musical and physical comedy, Campbell screamed and the audience roared their approval. However, it was during intermission and into the second act of the show where the brewing rivalries started coming to the surface. During the break, Manoogian's friend Bill McGurr made his way to the men's room where he noticed a group of boys shooting craps, smoking, and drinking wine hidden in a paper bags. 
More ominously, however, after taking the swigs of alcohol that they passed around to each other, the boys started donning bandanas, a sign of gang affiliation. When the show's second half commenced, the audience became rowdier, and as the teens roughhouse during the acts, both Joanne Campbell and Jack Hook, an associate of Freed's and Chuck Berry's manager, remembered Freed having to tell his audience to go back to their seats. Prompted by the Boston police who were ominously all around Freed's entourage and the stage, seemingly looking for an excuse to shut the show down. Jerry Lee Lewis, aggravated that he had to go on before Chuck Berry, gave one of the wildest performances of his career, flailing madly at the piano while gyrating suggestively, both in front of and on top of the piano. Just like in Chicago a year before for Gene Vincent's performance, the teens went wild, jumping out of the seats, dancing the aisles, and rushing the stage. Unlike the Chicago Youth Rally, however, the adult authorities in Boston were neither supportive or even tolerant of the audience's wild enthusiasm. A police sergeant warned Jack Hook that he would stop the show if the kids did not return to their seats. Freed was aggravated and frustrated with the Boston police since he viewed the audience reaction as a typical and natural response to the music. Freed went over to the microphone, reluctantly interrupting Jerry Lee Lewis's performance and instructing the audience to return to their seats or else the show wouldn't continue. Jerry Lee Lewis sulked at his piano, his temper barely kept in check. The audience complied and did what they could to remain in their seats for the remainder of Jerry Lee Lewis's set, all the while as Lewis did his best to upstage Chuck Berry. When Berry did go on to close the show, the teens got right back up out of their seats, dancing in the aisles and rushing the stage again. The police sergeant was now yelling at Jack Hook, threatening to put the house lights back on unless the teens returned to their seats. Hook was caught in the middle, well aware of the situation that was turning into a standoff between the Boston authorities and Alan Freed. Perhaps Boston's police would have done better to focus on actual security at the gate, searching the audience before admitting them in rather than attempting to control the teen's enthusiasm after the fact. Alan Freed reluctantly and angrily stormed over to the microphone again and it should be noted that he did so after the police sergeant ordered his men to turn the house lights on, stopping Chuck Berry's performance cold. In the audience, seated next to Manugian, the Band of Angels street gang were donning their colored bandanas, just as Manugian's friend Bill McGurr had observed another group of boys doing in the bathroom earlier during the intermission. The Boston police continued putting the pressure on Freed, and the sergeant even called out from the stage, ordering the kids to sit down. This show is not going on until everybody is in their seats. The audience suddenly went quiet. The sergeant wanted the lights on. Freed, for the enjoyment of his team customers, wanted the lights down. Freed signaled to Chuck Berry to continue. Barry himself, now feeling the tension, cautiously set out to continue his set. Another officer shoved into Freed in the wings, while angrily saying, We don't like your kind of music here. That was the final straw for Freed. This was when he made his now legendary, or infamous, statement into the microphone during Chuck Berry's harangued set. Jack Hook, one of Freed's own entourage was one of those that maintained that Freed did indeed say, Kids, the police in Boston won't put out the lights. I guess the Boston police don't want you to have a good time. Manugian and McGurr maintained that Freed said, Kids, they won't put out the lights. I guess they don't want you to have a good time. Whether explicitly stated or said with a pronoun, as an implication, they referred to the officials that were haranguing Freed on stage. The audience was angry and not at Freed. 
It was the perfect time for the band of angels and their unnamed gang rivals to commence their hostilities. Munuyan noted the glassy look of one of the boys sporting the bandanas, looking as if he were either drunk or on drugs. The glassy-eyed teen gangster collapsed over a railing, but one of his fellow brother members picked up a folding chair and tossed it over the railings. That is when, according to Manugian, things started raining down from the aisles and rafters onto the stage. Chuck Berry was visibly and understandably fearful for his safety. He took cover behind his drummer, yelling out, let's get the hell out of here. George Manugian led three of his friends who were seated with him through an underground corridor, escaping the arena and the melee by kicking open a fire door. Making their way to the parking garage, they tensely waited inside Mike Coppola's red 1952 Chevrolet sedan. The screams, shouts, and chaos enveloped around them from outside of the garage. Bill McGurr and Sal Gucciardi had purchased their tickets after Manugian, Coppola, and Chase, and were seated farther away from their three friends. When they saw Chuck Berry ducking for cover, McGurr and Gucciardi left their seats and began heading downstairs. As they were about to exit the rear doors, a loud roar crept up behind them. The two teenagers were suddenly swept up in a human wave that pushed them out of the doors separating them as a surge of panicked teenagers burst through the arena exit. Bill McGurr saw that his way to the parking garage was clear, so in his own words, calmly strolled like it was an afternoon at the beach. Sal Gucciardi, on the other hand, was caught up in the unwanted and additional gang rivalry that helped to contribute to the melee at the Boston Arena. Grabbed and slammed up against the car door, he stated that he thought he was a dead man. One of his would-be attackers came to his rescue, shouting out, No! No! He's not one of them! Gucciardi then made a burst of freedom towards his companions Manugian, Chase, Coppola, and McGurr. As the boys sped to safety in Coppola's 52 Chevy sedan, they noticed a woman being knocked down to the pavement as well as a group of teens circling around two boys who were engaged in a fight on the garage's lower level. Jack Hook maintains that Chuck Berry was able to finish his set, albeit amidst unwanted bright lighting mandated by the Boston police. A contrasting recollection from George Manugian, who stated that the show didn't have a proper ending due to the violence at the arena. Freed himself had maintained that when the show ended, there were teenagers waiting outside for him so that he could sign autographs. Again, George Manugian disputed this claim, stating that with the eruption of the crowds, it would have been impossible for Freed to have done so. According to the conflicting accounts, the press had claimed that the show had lasted past midnight, Considering Boston's strictly enforced blue laws, which prohibited entertainment past midnight, this also seems unlikely. A 19-year-old sailor, Albert Reggiani, as well as two of his teenage companions who had been outside of the arena, were assaulted in the melee, and Reggiani himself had been stabbed. There were reports of assaults, some of whom had definitely been the result of the event at the arena, while some, admittedly, had nothing whatsoever to do with the events at the arena, but which the Boston authorities falsely attributed to the concert. Freed, however, maintained that all reports of violence were grossly exaggerated. Exaggerated? Surely, but completely? Freed maintained that the teens who attended the show were all swell, wonderful kids, no doubt either unaware or unwilling to acknowledge the presence of the warring band of angels and their rivals, who were also in attendance, contributing to what would eventually occur. That gang would be featured in a series of articles by Edward McGrath for the Boston Daily Globe as they, apparently, sought to consolidate with neighboring gangs in the hub area, 
similar to the fictional gangs named in Saul Urich's novel, later to be made into Walter Hill's cult 1979 crime drama, The Warriors. Curiously, Edward McGrath's series on Boston Street Gangs and the Band of Angels ended abruptly and incomplete, despite promises to readers of continued coverage on the subject. The Suffolk County, Massachusetts grand jury handed down an indictment against Freed, while District Attorney Garrett Byrne sought to prosecute Freed on an anti-anarchy charge. The FBI, keeping tabs on Morris Levy, the head of Roulette Records and an associate of the Joseph Colombo crime family, now started paying attention to Freed's association with Levy due to the negative publicity brought on by the events at the Boston Arena. Freed would be fired from his position at WINS Radio, the negative press being the final straw in a working relationship that had been strained for years, even though it was Freed's rock and roll program that helped put WINS on the map. The following year, Freed would be the major scapegoat in the payola scandal, an investigation into the practice of disc jockeys accepting bribes in exchange for airplay which it should be noted was a common practice and technically legal, as long as the disc jockey in question was open and upfront about the acceptance of pay for airplay, something for which few disc jockeys, Freed included, would never admit to doing. Freed died in 1965 from complications brought on by alcoholism, penniless and broke one of too many rock and roll casualties. He did live to see rock and roll survive long past the time it was expected to be a passing fad, as the wave of British mercy beat bands had invaded the American charts, themselves having grown up and been fans of the very artists that Freed himself helped to popularize. The same fate would not befall Dick Clark. The world's oldest teenager had been on a mission to clean up rock and roll's image in order to forge his own self-contained and highly profitable music empire. Ever since Clark took over Bandstand from former host Bob Horn in July of 1956, Clark had been a disc jockey for WFIL's radio station in Philadelphia and had served as a substitute host for WFIL's local TV show, Bandstand, whenever the original host, Bob Horn, went on vacation. When Horn was fired over a drunk driving incident, Clark became the regular host. At that time, rock and roll was still perceived to be, in the mainstream media and general adult public, as threatening. The music of juvenile delinquents, an image that Clark felt would be detrimental to Bandstand's growth, as well as his commercial vision for rock and roll. When Bandstand went from being a local, after-school TV dance show to being an ABC-affiliated national show, Clark began taking steps to make rock and roll, his version of rock and roll, more appealing to a mainstream, suburban, middle-class audience, progressively younger teens, and even pre-teens, presumably with enough spending cash to buy the records that he both promoted and had a financial stake in, as well as performers that their parents wouldn't object to, in the way that they did to the likes of a hip-shaking Elvis Presley, a boisterous, womanizing Jerry Lee Lewis, an African-American and bisexual Little Richard, or a craggy and leering Gene Vincent. First, however, would be the presenting to the American viewing audience of Clark's fan base. The dancers on American Bandstand were to be stars in their own right, but they had to be wholesome, clean-cut, all-American, well-groomed, and well-mannered. They were to be presented to the American mainstream as examples of the kinds of teens that listened to Clark's brand of rock and roll. 
In other words, unlike the mainstream perception of what made up the fans of Alan Freed's brand of rock and roll, Dick Clark's fans, who danced daily on American Bandstand, had to look like this, and not like this. Carol Scalderferry and Joe Fusco were among the regulars on Dick Clark's American Bandstand. As a team, Carol Scalderferry had danced on American Bandstand from 1957 to 1961. During an interview for Ron Mann's 1992 documentary Twist, Scalderferry, under her married name Spada, recalled the concerns of the 1950s that if rock and roll were to be seen on television, teenagers would become juvenile delinquents. In the same interview, Joe Fusco recalled the many rules that were in place behind the scenes on bandstand. No suggestive dancing, such as the grind of the fish, dances that were popular among inner city teens at their jumps and hops. No chewing gum or combing hair on camera. By Joe Fusco's reckoning, there were just a lot of things that you couldn't do, stating that Clark wanted a clean-cut image for his dancers, the fans of his music that he would present to the viewing public. Ironically, even though these rules were meant for bandstand to appeal to a broader middle-class viewing audience, many of the dancers themselves actually came from a working-class urban background. And sadly, the presentation of wholesome teens on American Bandstand often had unexpected consequences for those very dancers on the show. Philadelphia is an inner city, and, then as now, had its share of youth gangs. As recalled in Bandstand Diaries, some of the Bandstand dancers would literally run the gauntlet in order to get to the WFIL TV studios. One dancer recalled being hung from the elevated railroad tracks by gang members. The reason for this harassment and bullying by the teen gangs towards the bandstand dancers, a pattern that would repeat itself with other local TV dance show participants by local gangs, San Francisco's KPIX dance party with Dick Stewart being an example, was that the street gang teens thought of American bandstand's male dancers as soft and effeminate with homophobic slurs such as fairy and faggot being curled at the male bandstand dancers whenever their paths would cross. Bandstand regular Frank Brancaccio related in a 2014 interview that during his time on bandstand as a teen dancer, whenever he would be recognized in the streets of Philly, slurs of bandstand faggot would be hurled in his direction. One vivid example of the bandstand dancers encountering physical violence at the hands of Philadelphia street gangs is a story recalled by bandstand regular Arlene Sullivan. She recalled the time when her dance partner, Kenny Rossi, who incidentally is straight, was attacked by the Philly gang as they both exited the L elevated train in North Philadelphia. Both Sullivan and Rossi had to fight off the gang members in order to make their escape. Most gang members were usually not fans of the softer and admittedly whiter stylings on shows like Bandstand and TV teen dance shows of that genre. And not only would physically assault the Bandstand dancers, but actively rejected the notion of participating in such shows, again, for homophobic reasons. The irony of this supposed defense of manhood by the gangs is that often some of the most violently homophobic 50s gang members themselves were homosexual or bisexual. The Cape Man, Salvador Agron, being an example. This of course is in direct contrast from what was portrayed in the 1978 film adaptation of the musical Grease where members of Danny Zuko's T-Birds and their gang rivals enthusiastically participate in a televised broadcast of National Bandstand, hosted by Vince Fontaine, portrayed by one-time TV teen idol Ed Burns of 77 Cents and Strip. On an even darker note in regards to American Bandstand, there are claims by some former Bandstand regulars that the producers of the show had their own purges of suspected teen homosexuals in order to protect the show's image and ratings. 
Some allegations state that spies were sent to Rittenhouse Square, a known meeting place at the time for Philadelphia's homosexuals. If any dancer was caught there, he would be kicked off the show. Next would come the promotion of teen idols that would be physically attractive, but whose sexuality was played down in order to appear non-threatening. When referencing the concept of the teen idol in relation to what Dick Clark had in mind for American Bandstand, both Pat Boone and Ricky Nelson have to be exempted from this narrative since Boone had actually started out as a Tin Pan Alley crooner, admittedly one who was younger than his contemporaries, thus having more of a teen appeal. Boone had made a career, in addition to his ballads, by the common and questionable practice of cover records, the re-recording of black artists' original rhythm and blues rock and roll songs for mainstream airplay, at usually higher pay rates and royalties than the black originals. Boone's covering of Little Richard's originals would be the prime examples of this, and is usually a source of ridicule and unintentional humor by hardcore rock and roll fans and collectors. By contrast, the teen idols that would come in the wake of Bandstand would sing original rock and roll songs. Rock and roll, that is, of a lighter, softer, pop-oriented variety. Boone, however, would join with the Bandstand teen idols in the way of the types of fans they would attract and appear with them in 1960's Coke Time special on Teenagers. Ricky Nelson, the youngest son of the Nelson family, seen regularly on The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet, was actually a fan of harder-edged rockabilly. He had collected singles from the legendary Sun Records, and Carl Perkins was Nelson's role model. He made friends with the likes of Buddy Holly, Eddie Cochran, and Richie Valens, and while visiting the set of the 1957 movie Carnival Rock, he had a chance to observe rockabilly artist Bob Lumen and his backup band, The Shadows. It was there that he recruited rock guitarist virtuoso James Burton later of the show Shindig, to be his lead guitarist. Ricky Nelson did indeed project a clean-cut image, a consequence of his parents' sitcom format, but he was also a genuine rock and roll fan, and a legitimate rockabilly performer. It should also be noted that like Elvis Presley, Ricky Nelson had never appeared on Clark's bandstand. For our purposes, the first of the types of clean-cut teen idols that would become the staple of Clark's cleaned-up and non-threatening, and hence non-delinquent teen idols, was Paul Anka. Hailing from Canada, the teen had been performing and writing songs since he was a child. Anka recorded his first teen pop single in 1956, featuring a song he had written himself with the recording financed by his uncle. I Confess wasn't exactly a hit, but it did at least garner enough attention to get Anka booked onto the show rosters of some of the more popular rock and roll concert promoters of that time. Anka was one of many performers on Alan Freed's Brooklyn Paramount shows. He was also on the roster for Irving Feld's biggest show of stars. It was the aforementioned performance for Feld's 1958 tour that had the fight in the audience which gained a bit of minor, if unwelcome, public attention. Anka's initial performances for Freed shows were met with, at best, indifference and at worst, ridicule, since the inner city street-oriented teens who attended Freed's shows were more inclined towards harder-edged rhythm and blues artists as well as street corner doo-wop singers and working class country infused visiting rockabilly artists. Rhythm and blues, however, was the favorite type of rock and roll that these kids were into, and Anka's syrupy ballads and teen laments were seen as weak, lame, and, ironically, white bread. An ironic statement, considering that seated and dancing among Freed's African-American fan base included a good amount of inner-city Italian and Irish teenagers as well. According to one of the crickets, Anka was even the recipient of physical bullying by Laverne Baker, who allegedly tarred and feathered him with Vaseline and the stuffing of a pillowcase. In spite of these obstacles, or perhaps because of these obstacles, Anka scored a hit in July of 1957. 
Diana, an up-tempo teen love letter to an older girl whom he had a crush on. From there, he followed up his success with other teen ballads and laments, such as You Are My Destiny, 1958, and 1959's It's Time to Cry and Put Your Head on My Shoulder, all of which were heavily promoted on Dick Clark's American Bandstand. Anka's success provided the blueprint for Clark, as well as for a duo of managers and music producers by the name of Bob Marcucci and Peter DeAngelis, founders of the Philadelphia-based Chancellor Records. Marcucci was a savvy entrepreneur. He was well aware of the changing tide that was going on in the teen music industry, particularly in the wake of certain tragedies, scandals, and occurrences that coincidentally seemed to occur one after the other between 1958 to 1960. Jerry Lee Lewis would be ostracized and scandalized when, during his May 1958 tour of London, it was revealed that he had married his 13-year-old cousin, Myra Gale, his third wife, while also, apparently, forgetting to divorce his second wife, Jane Mitchum. Chuck Berry would be arrested and tried for the violation of the Mann Act, transporting a 14-year-old prostitute, Janice Escalante, from Juarez, Mexico, to Berry's club bandstand in St. Louis, Missouri, for immoral purposes, with Chuck Berry claiming that he had hired her to work as a hat check girl at his club. During the trial, the judge referred to Berry as that Negro and Escalante as the Indian. Elvis Presley was drafted in 1958. At the time, Presley's manager, Colonel Tom Parker, saw the drafting as an opportunity to clean up Presley's image in the public mind, having his boy serve right alongside the regulars rather than taking an assignment as an army entertainer. However, many in the music industry wondered if Presley's absence of two years would affect his career and popularity, a genuine concern given the fickle nature of the teenage music buying public. The most tragic of these incidents, however, occurred on February 3, 1959, over Clear Lake, Iowa, when the single-engine plane carrying 17-year-old Richie Valens, popular disc jockey-turned-performer J.P. the Big Bopper Richardson, and singer-songwriter Buddy Holly, crashed in a winter storm that was taking them from one venue to the other during the Winter Dance Party Tour. The teen world would never be the same again. Observing these events, while also noting the somewhat dark features of Presley, Marcucci reasoned that a vaguely ethnic look among teen singers was the key to the teen market, particularly for girls ages 13 to 17. The music of these artists, however, would be considerably toned down and somewhat removed from the rhythm and blues roots of rock and roll, and given a pop music veneer if not to actually appeal to adults, then to at least alleviate their concerns over juvenile delinquency. In rapid succession, Frankie Avalon and Bobby Rydell, born Francis Avalone and Robert Ridarelli, were offered up as wholesome, clean teen substitutes for the absent Presley on Clark's bandstand, with Avalon being managed by Marcucci while recording on his and Peter DeAngelis' Chancellor label. Rydell was also on Clark's bandstand, of course, but was actually managed by his own father and not by Marcucci. The two up-and-coming teen idols had actually been child performers with previous experience at singing and playing instruments, Avalon being a trumpeter for a local Philadelphia band, Rocco and the Saints. However, Marcucci's belief in image was so strong that he reasoned a teen idol didn't even need to have any experience at all in order to be popular. Hence, the virtual creation of the second of the teen idols under Marcucci's Chancellor label that would be popularized on Dick Clark's American Bandstand. Fabian Forte was a 16-year-old student at South Philadelphia High School when his father, a police officer, suffered a debilitating heart attack leaving the teenager as the sole breadwinner for his family. By coincidence, Bob Marcucci had spotted the high schooler, noting his uncanny physical resemblance to both Presley and Ricky Nelson. 
he asked the teen if he would like to be a rock and roll performer. Fabian thought he was insane, given that he had no prior experience as a singer. Marcucci was insistent, but the teen, initially at least, was not interested. However, due to his father's condition and his family's financial situation, Fabian lamented. Due to Fabian's lack of experience, which exacerbated his uncomfortable feelings regarding singing, the quality of his initial singles under Marcucci's and DeAngelis' Chancellor label were less than desirable. However, he did score local hits, which is how he came to the attention of Dick Clark. Clark would feature Fabian on one of his local record hops. Though Fabian lip-synced at the hop, and according to Clark, just stood there, Fabian's looks, as well as that extra, intangible something that enables stardom, encouraged the pre-teenage girls to scream. The boys, however, remained indifferent, a trend that would continue throughout the teenage idol phase of Fabian's career that would quickly turn into ridicule. The criticisms and barbs coming from some of the teenage listeners, primarily male, as well as most music critics, would become a source of tension that would weigh heavily on the young performer. That, along with Marcucci's strict and heavy-handed management of his client, gave the young man a feeling of being manipulated. A rift between singer and manager was slowly developing. For the time being, however, both Clark and Marcucci knew that they had a potential star on their hands. Apparently, Clark shared in Marcucci's belief that the image a singer projected was more important to financial success than experience or natural talent. You've got a star on your hands. Now all you have to do is teach them how to sing. This was in 1958. Dick Clark's willingness to promote a teen with little experience at performing while risking professional ridicule in order to build his stable of cleaner, safer, and non-threatening teen idols was given a sense of urgency due to two events that occurred that year. The first, of course, was the drafting of Elvis Presley. The potential vacuum left by the absence of the king of rock and roll was too good of an opportunity for music entrepreneurs to pass up. It was also a temporary one as Presley would be mustered out in 1960, so the development of teen idols like Fabian and the releasing of their records while exposing them to Presley's former audience had to be done relatively quickly before the King's return. However, the continued allegations in the press over harder-edged rock and rolls attracting of juvenile delinquency was brought home to Clark by an incident in 1958 that occurred about a mile away from the WFIL studios, literally a 15-minute walk from where American Bandstand was regularly taped. The incident brought unwelcome attention to the city of Brotherly Love's teenagers in a way that Clark did not want. Even worse, it occurred after a local rock and roll dance party. On the night of April 28, 1958, a one-time civilian interpreter for the United States Army during the Korean War by the name of In Ho Oh stepped outside of the apartment complex that he shared with his uncle towards a mailbox across the street in order to mail a letter to his parents in South Korea. The 26-year-old graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania was studying political science after having graduated in 1957 at the Eastern Baptist College with a degree in philosophy. His family were devout Christians, and after having escaped the communist takeover of North Korea, had decided that he wanted to become a South Korean statesman when he finished his studies as a foreign exchange student at the University of Pennsylvania. Unfortunately, that same night, a few blocks away, about 11 teenage boys, including 15-year-old Douglas MacArthur Clark, 17-year-old Robert Williams, and another teen, Alfonso Borum, had been ejected from a local rock and roll dance party. 
Conflicting reports state that they either did not have enough to pay the 65 cents entry fee or that they were ejected due to the dress code. In any case, these teens were angry and they had also been drinking. They were ready to pounce on whoever was in their way to take money for the dance party that they felt should not have denied them. Unfortunately, the 26-year-old graduate exchange student from South Korea, the young man who came from a family with strong Christian beliefs, happened to be in the way. According to an eyewitness account by 18-year-old Edward McLeod, printed in the October 1st, 1958 issue of the Philadelphia Inquirer, he witnessed the boys gathering near the spot where In Ho Oh would later be attacked, drinking and working themselves up. When they saw O oh at the mailbox, they attacked. He was able to break free and run, but Alfonso Borum ran O oh down, striking him in the head with a bottle. When O oh fell, Borum kicked the University of Pennsylvania student repeatedly, the others with him following suit, kicking O oh until he was unconscious. Borum then rolled his victim over, finding an empty wallet. The boys then ran. O died as a result of the beating, and the public put pressure on Philadelphia's mayor, Richardson Dilworth, who, overcome with both grief and shame, wept at the funeral of In Ho O. Oh. The South Korean ambassador, Dr. Yu Chan Yang, publicly expressed his shock and disappointment at the murder of one of his country's nationals in a city that, by his account, was one of the outstanding cultural cities in the United States. The ceasefire to the Korean War was just five years before, with South Korea being an important ally with the United States during the Cold War. Thus, the local Philadelphia gang-related murder was gaining unwanted international attention on the world stage and a source of anti-American propaganda by America's Cold War opponents. Fingers were being pointed and blame for the murder was shared all around. Charges were brought before the Philadelphia City Council Committee that the police department had been short by 165 officers of the quota provided by council appropriations. The shortage of officers allegedly being a major factor in why youth crime was on the rise in Philadelphia. In response, Philadelphia's police commissioner, Thomas Gibbons, described as the incorruptible for his fight against the mafia, initiated a citywide roundup mass arrests of repeat offenders with a reported number of 2,000 arrests. This following the apprehending of the 11 accused of In Ho O's murder. Public outrage at the murder was so intense that the defense requested a change of venue citing inflammatory public opinion in the Philadelphia press. However, the defiant behavior of the accused combined with the national outrage covered in the press made such a change seem useless. The defendant's case was not helped when one of the boys, a 16-year-old who had originally agreed to become a material witness in exchange for a lighter sentence by the name of Harry McLeod, briefly escaped after being placed in the same room with hardened, older, adult criminals. With them, McLeod had broken out of the holding cell but was later picked up along with the other escapees. Judge Louis E. Leventhal had decided that whether the case would be tried in Philadelphia or elsewhere, the impartiality or bias of any jury during the summer of 1958 would be the same as the case had received national coverage. The trial would be held in Philadelphia. It was the reaching out by O's own family, both in the U.S. and in South Korea, that offered either a glimmer of hope or misplaced idealism, depending on one's point of view. Citing their own Christian beliefs, as well as what they had read about in their country's newspapers in regards to racial segregation in the U.S., the O family petitioned the Philadelphia court and the American ambassador to South Korea that mercy be shown to the boys arrested, with funds gathered by the O family be placed in a trust to be used for the, quote, religious, educational, vocational and social guidance of the boys when they are released. Their calls for mercy and forgiveness had the unintended effect of exacerbating heated debates over coddling of street gangs, an issue which had been debated just the year before. 
when the murder of handicapped 15-year-old Michael Farmer, committed by the Egyptian Kings and Dragon street gangs over in New York, sparked national notoriety and outrage. Tragically, these debates over the supposed coddling of troubled young people accused of committing violent crimes would continue that year as within the span of a few months and even a few days, other and most frighteningly unrelated incidents of violent youth crime would coincidentally follow after the murder of In Ho O. Oh. The following month, miles away over in New York at Jefferson Park, an eerily similar incident occurred, this one committed by members of the East Harlem Red Wings street gang upon 24-year-old Cuban immigrant Julio Ramos, who was sitting at a park bench with his girlfriend. Apparently, the gang mistook the young adult Ramos for being a Puerto Rican teenager when they beat him to death in front of his horrified girlfriend in a manner not unlike what had happened to In Ho O oh near the University of Pennsylvania. Before that, and coincidentally happening on the very same night as the murder of In Ho O, oh, a 20-year-old leader of the Egyptian Crown's street gang, Ramon Serra, gunned down 16-year-old gang rival Michael Ramos at a Bronx candy store after this Ramos had given Sarah a dirty look. Ironically, it was Sarah's own 14-year-old girlfriend, Alice Beron, who aided police in the capture of the young gangster, who himself was just barely out of his teens. Three days after the simultaneous and unrelated murders of In Ho O oh and Michael Ramos, over at Massapeka High School in Long Island, 15-year-old Bruce Zator ambushed fellow 15-year-old Timothy Wall in the boys' bathroom with his own shotgun, killing Wall instantly. Apparently, Zator was the victim of bullying and had decided that the best way to deal with the problem was to shoot his tormentor. Two months later, that same year of 1958, San Francisco Bay Area drugstore owner Kenneth Outland was pulled out of his car by a teenage gang who he had refused to sell liquor to. Unlike O, or Julio Ramos for that matter, Outland was lucky. He didn't die from the beating that he received at the hands of this apparently Bart street gang. Bart's being the San Francisco 50s era gang subculture noted for their wearing of club jackets and Ben Davis trousers. Though the 42-year-old Outland suffered permanent lasting brain damage from the beating. All of these incidents, including the beating death of In Ho O, oh, were overshadowed that year by the murder spree committed by teenage serial killer Charles Starkweather in tow with his 14-year-old girlfriend, Carol Ann Fugit, up north in Lincoln, Nebraska. Starkweather's murderous rampage sparked such a panic in both Nebraska and Montana that the National Guard was actually called in to hunt down the teenage killer. To this day, there is debate as to whether or not the 14-year-old Fugate was actually a willing accomplice or an unwilling kidnapping victim herself, though there is absolutely no doubt whatsoever as to Starkweather's guilt concerning the 11 innocent victims who died at the end of his shotgun barrel. Within this context, perhaps the reaction by the Philadelphia authorities to the O family's well-intentioned letter of mercy and epistle born out of their own heartbreak over the loss of their loved one as well as their Christian beliefs was, somewhat at least, understandable. Philadelphia Municipal Court Judge Keller Gilbert angrily berated the pleading for the poor misguided defendants, as well as the implied vilifying of judges who were acting in the public safety when sentencing gang members who were found guilty of having committed violent crimes. The O family's idealism or dedication to their beliefs in the face of the loss of a beloved family member would have to take a back seat to the public and official outrage over growing inner city youth crime. The teens convicted of O's murder ranged in ages from 15 to 19. Out of all of them, however, 
It was 19-year-old Alfonso Borum who undoubtedly received the harshest sentence. Going by the eyewitness testimony of one of the participants, Edward McLeod, perhaps understandably so. Borum, known as Flip Borum in his neighborhood, had a long police record that included burglary and assault. As previously mentioned, he was the one who beat O with a bottle, leading the stomping attack on the floored graduate student. Borum sat and listened coolly with no signs of emotion as the jury delivered its verdict of guilty. While Borum's mother Ruth wept, Judge Joseph Sloan handed down his sentence. It would be the death penalty for 19-year-old Alfonso Flip Borum. As for the fate of the younger friends who had participated in the beating, 17-year-old Franklin Marshall would serve 10 to 20, while 16-year-old Leonard Johnson would be handed a life sentence. 16-year-olds Douglas MacArthur Clark and the recaptured escapee Harry McLeod, 17-year-olds James Wright, Robert Williams, Percy Johnson, and Lonnie Collins, as well as 18-year-olds Harold Johnson and the previously mentioned Edward McLeod, who had turned state's witness against his friends, would receive long prison terms. The attention on Philadelphia's teenage street gangs in the wake of the Inho-O murder at the University of Pennsylvania, literally a 15-minute walk away from WFIL, was potentially bad for business for Dick Clark and his carefully crafted teenage fans of rock and roll as good teenagers image that he was trying to sell. But like all good businessmen, he simply pushed through. He even suggested stories in the various popular teenage magazines of how his clean-cut and family-oriented teen idols had resisted the temptations of street gang life in order to espouse wholesome, family-friendly, all-American values. By 1959, with the harder-edged and rebellious rock and roll singers out of the picture and Alan Freed's career in ruins, Dick Clark's American Bandstand, with its brand of wholesome, clean-cut, lip-syncing pop teen idols making the cute, well-dressed, and well-behaved teen dancers swoon and sway daily on national TV, now ruled the lucrative youth market. If Dick Clark was instrumental in the toning down of rock and roll in the late 1950s, he was also a key player in the eventual erasing of the actual nature of 1950s juvenile delinquency from collective memory during the height of the fad for 50s nostalgia two decades later. His later 1970s broadcasts of American Bandstand and his good old days TV specials promoted the fictional humorous image of the greaser a family-friendly character based on the visual representation of the 1950s juvenile delinquent, but with all hint of potential danger removed, while associated with rock and roll music. Rock and roll music, that is, that was no longer opposed by the establishment, which rock and roll originally was, but was now a part of that establishment. Background dancers on the good old days are clearly seen dressed in the manner of the greaser or delinquent, but unlike their 50s predecessors, they are now smiling while performing with a people-pleasing dance style. Gone was the aggressive bravado of actual 1950s professional performance dancers. This bravado, it should be noted, would later be used by another working-class music and youth culture emanating from the streets. Hip-hop. The simultaneous fear and the relevancy of the 50s delinquent was also gone. The greaser now being a beloved character, beloved while also becoming a character to be laughed at. The young 50s bad boy was now a quaint, older, nice guy. The strictly enforced dress code that Clark used to distance his fans from delinquency was not only rescinded, but Clark actively encouraged this new greaser image. Leather jackets, jeans, along with a new toned down image, was now encouraged, something that Clark's 50s era dancers were prohibited from exhibiting during the actual 1950s. This new benign image of the 50s greaser proved so profitable in selling both 
repackaged rock and roll as oldies, as well as newly recorded retro 50s recordings, often by actors and their popular sitcom characters. It was even sold to children in the way of toys and Halloween costumes, something that could never have happened during the actual 1950s. Public service announcements aimed at children even utilized the image. Of course, times change, and any means that could effectively keep children safe should be used. However, it was, and is, a far cry from the reality of 50s era gang life. The origins of the term greaser, later to be used as a modern catch-all phrase for all 50s gang subcultures, and not referring to the racial epithet, can be traced to Chicago. The term was regional, unused by New York's bopping clubs or cliques, or San Francisco's Bart or White Shoe gangs. New York's Mau Mau's and the East Harlem Red Wings, or San Francisco's Los Gavilanes, or the San Bruno Avenue gang, though teen gangs of the 1950s, wouldn't have been described as greasers during the time of their existence. But the rebels, out of Chicago's Cornell Square, could rightly be described as a 50s greaser gang. However, going by the historical record, the 1955 drive-by shooting committed by 14-year-old Clement Cookie Massis, the 1956 shooting of Warren White by Fred Cruz during a gang rumble, and the 1957 beating death of Farragut honor roll student Alvin Palmer led by Joseph Schwartz, at least this real-life greaser gang could hardly be described as harmless. Incidentally, the original 1972 stage play production of Grease takes place in Chicago, another possible origin for the modern usage of the greaser term. The two wars that alternately preceded and followed the 1950s provided the origins of 1950s delinquency and the erasing of its more brutal nature from modern collective memory. 1969's Woodstock three-day concert in Bethel, New York was the iconic counterculture's artistic reaction to the Vietnam War, the first televised war that brought the horrors and brutality of armed conflict into American living rooms on a daily basis. Unlike World War II, Vietnam polarized and fractured the nation, and in response, Woodstock was hyped as three days of love, peace, and of course music. Among the various acid rock and folk bands was a seemingly anachronistic neo doo group from Columbia University, Sha Na Na. Sha Na Na outfitted themselves on stage in a parody of the 1950s delinquent, or benign greaser, perhaps out of necessity as the sharp, fashionable look sported by doo groups of the 1950s and early 1960s, thin ties, suits with peg slacks and dress shoes, was now looked upon by the hippie counterculture as being too straight. As quoted in this 1972 issue of Life magazine, the flight to the 50s was a search for a supposedly happier time before drugs, assassination, and Vietnam. Within this context, the delinquent image and the realities of 50s gang life had to be toned down and turned into a laughable image when associated with nostalgic acts like Sha Na Na or when used in selling rock and roll oldies collections. World War II, on the other hand, provided the causes of the reality of post-war delinquency. I've handled lots of problem kids in my time. Kids from both sides of the tracks. They were five or six years old in the last war. Father in the army, mother in a defense plant. No home life, no church life, no place to go. They formed street gangs. The study of post-traumatic stress disorder was still in its infancy, and for those veterans who actually survived the war, there were among them those who often went undiagnosed with the condition, sometimes with disastrous results. One member of the Sinners, 
one of several New York street gangs going by that name in the late 1950s and early 1960s, related how his father, a veteran of the landing at Iwo Jima, would often wake up screaming at night, frightening both he and his siblings, and his mother. His father would find solace in the bottle, becoming an alcoholic and often verbally abusive to the wife and children whenever he actually was home. His parents later divorced and the then youth would seek a sense of belonging as well as strong male role models among the sinners. This story, sadly, was all too common for inner city teenage boys between the years 1946 to 1962. Their lives were rough, they played rough, and that mindset was reflected in the music that the inner city gang teens listened to. Ed of the Sinners had this to say regarding mainstream 1950s teens and the music favored by the street teens of that time. People should understand that teens of the 1950s and early 60s were not all alike. I wouldn't be caught dead with a teen idol record, except for the fact that Top 10 Radio played a lot of it and Bandstand had these acts on all the time, I wouldn't even know that they existed. That's one of the reasons so many of us listen to Jocko, to avoid this type of music. It isn't bad, it just wasn't our thing. Harder edged rock and roll spoke to these kids, soft teen pop did not. Rock and roll didn't cause delinquency as some adults of that time accused, but it was favored by the teens of that subculture and in the cases of certain rock subgenres such as doo-wop sprang from the same streets that bred youth gangs. With American society's concern over post-war youth crime, of course Hollywood answered with a whole genre of films, a subgenre of crime noir, the juvenile delinquent movie. Real gang teens seem to, somewhat at least, enjoy watching the 20-something actors and even 30-something actors who portrayed them on screen, though the real teen boppers often balked at how mainstream movies represented their language, stylized as a result of film censorship, their customs, and the assumptions of how the mainstream thought gang members looked and dressed. Ed of the Sinners remarked on the black leather jacketed motorcycle look, often attributed exclusively to late 1950s gang teens. I just figured it was some adult's idea of what a gangbanger should look like. Nobody I knew rode a motorcycle in his mid-teens. That hat might have been the dumbest thing that I've ever seen on the screen. That hat would have been considered corny in the late 1950s and early 60s. If you were caught wearing one in my neighborhood, you would have been killed and eaten right after we all stopped laughing our asses off at it. When asked whether or not the media, such as comic books, references to violent crime in songs such as Stagger Lee and Big Boy Pete, or juvenile delinquent books and movies such as The Cool World influenced he and his friends, Ed responded, no, we didn't need the media to teach us how to behave violently. We already had more than enough crime in our neighborhood. Bay Area Poet Laureate Patrick Coonan was the former president of the Junior Jokers, a San Francisco Bart street gang from Candlestick Cove between the years 1958 to 1962. The idea that inner city gang life of the 1950s and early 60s was somehow innocent, consisting exclusively of pranks and hijinks, as depicted in many of the 1970s nostalgia fad movies set in the 1950s and early 60s, is disputed by an incident that Patrick related. Around 1961, I was walking up Blanken Avenue towards the Bayshore Highway with a friend of mine. He wasn't a part of our club, but he was a good friend. He was a part of a group of guys who were from Visitation Valley. They didn't have a club name, but that's where they were from. Anyway, this car full of guys cruised by and they flipped us off. So my buddy, he's wearing a trench coat and he says, watch this. Next thing I know, he pulls out a shotgun. Well, he takes a shot at these guys as they are driving off and blows out their rear window. I tell him, hey, if you want to fight these guys, I'm down with that, but I'm not down with killing anybody. 
The recollections of San Francisco-based inner-city gang life of the post-war era by Patrick, as well as others who are also a part of that subculture, will be the subject of our next episode. However, Patrick's opinions regarding the 1950s era Hollywood image of the juvenile delinquent should be noted here. He had this to say regarding the mainstream portrayal of gangs in the 1961 version of West Side Story. I watched it. It was alright. A good movie. But we thought the names of the gangs in that were corny. I never knew any jets or sharks. I did know the warlords, and we had a skirmish with the lonely ones at Galileo High School. A buddy of mine was in the Royal Lancers. Jets and sharks? Corny. Patrick's thoughts on Greece? Those idiots would have gotten their asses handed to them in my neighborhood. Patrick and I laughed when he related that during our phone interview, which sparked a discussion over how the mainstream now laughs at the supposed quaintness of early rock and roll culture because of the cute greaser image created during the nostalgia fad of the 1970s. Those within the vintage rockabilly subculture who I spoke to, a movement that coincidentally had begun at the same time as the nostalgia fad, had also shared personal experiences where casual, non-fans of 50s culture had dismissed 50s youth as irrelevant while even laughing at rock and roll culture, supposedly for being too goody-goody, a consequence of that carefree and innocent image created during the 1970s nostalgia fad. It would be up to the writers within the current rockabilly subculture to show that it was in the exploring of the actual reality of 50s teen cultures, both the benign and the more tragic aspects, that the history of 1950s youth was still relevant when comparing supposedly modern issues and artistic expressions commonly associated with today. And want to fight, we're going to fight. Next, and our final chapter, as the gang war on Manhattan's Lower East Side reaches a crisis level, one man seeks to keep the peace, while across the country in San Francisco, news of the troubles in New York, as well as local conflict, threaten to undermine the work of local teens as city officials in San Francisco vacillate between cooperation and a get-tough policy with its own inner city youth. And the modern rockabilly subculture brings a fresh look to 50s vintage culture for modern audiences and bringing with it the juvenile delinquent image. Only this time, however, the actual history is presented with writers such as Miriam Linna and Martin Heafy pulling no punches. Light the Dark Streets, our final chapter in the Nostalgic Myths and Historical Reality Juvenile Delinquency series. If you haven't already, hit the like and subscribe buttons so you are notified of our new videos. And if you'd like to support the channel, $3 a month goes towards research materials and you will have access to exclusive content. Remember to check out my other YouTube channel. This channel researches the history while that channel explores the modern expression of that history through free vintage swing dance instruction videos and fitness videos for seniors done to a vintage rock and roll background. Subscribe to both channels and you won't miss a beat. Before we go, I'd like to give a shout out and a big thank you to our Patreon patrons, Davina Charlotte, Susie Clarkston, Don Ishisaki, Diane Morimune, Ken Patterson, Carol Rodriguez, and Ron Spain. Your support helps the channel to grow, and we couldn't do this without you, so a big thank you. See you all next time for our third and final installment.